When we imagine dinosaurs, we think big. But we need to look at the small details to understand the complete story. How can scientists reveal the world of dinosaurs through tiny fossils? We'll find out today when we talk with paleontologist Matt Carano. I forgot how much fun these can be. Welcome everyone, thanks for joining us for another episode of Live From Curious, Smithsonian Science House. So happy to have you here. Today we have a very special guest. With us now is curator of Dinosauria and paleontologist from the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, Dr. Matthew Carano. Matt, thank you so much for being here today. It's great to be here, thanks. Matt, today you're gonna to help us understand how you study microfossils to better understand dinosaurs and the places that they lived in. But I think to kick off our show, we should start at the beginning with you Fair telling enough. us a little bit about what you do as a paleontologist here at the Smithsonian. Sure, sure. Uh, well, I'm a paleontologist, so really all that means is I study ancient life. Um, I happen to study dinosaurs, but paleontologists can study plants or clams or whatever. And so I'm a curator, so I care for the collection, I study what we have in the museum, and I go out and I get new fossils. It sounds like a really cool job. It's a great job. <laughs> um, and of course, we're going to talk about it today. So before you tell us exactly how you study those dinosaurs, I think we should ask our viewers how they think you do that. What yeah, do you say? I'd like to hear. All right. Viewers, here's an opportunity to participate in a live poll to tell us what you're thinking. Tell us, scientists study dinosaurs by assembling whole skeletons, comparing to living animals, collecting fossil fragments, or recreating ecosystems. Take a moment to think about it and put your answer in the window that appears to the right of your video. So I think a lot of people took a clue from our topic today. It seems like it. <laughs> and so most of the responses were at 63% say that collecting fossil fragments is how you study dinosaurs. What do you say? That's a good answer. I think those people are right, but I think uh, it's a little bit of a trick question because the other people are also right. <laughs> uh, so we do all these things in paleontology and it's actually important to do all of them. Um, because you'll learn different things by doing each of those different things. And so has this always been the way that paleontologists have worked? Have they always done all of these things or have they traditionally focused on um, just collecting fossils maybe? A long time I think in the history of paleontology really collecting was the most important thing. And you know if you can imagine 150, 200 years ago being the first people to find dinosaur fossils I mean, you just, you don't have any context. What are these things? So what you need is you need to find them. You need to find good fossils and put them together and understand what they are. And so for a long time, that's really what the focus was. And in fact, when you go to museums today, you're seeing skeletons most of the time that were collected probably more than 100 years ago. And what do these whole skeletons tell us? They tell us, I think, um, the really straightforward thing, which is, you know, what does the animal look like? But they tell us things in detail about the animal as well that record things about its history, its evolution, maybe what it ate, how it moved. Um, but some of it is really just simple puzzle, you know, what's this puzzle look like? I mean, if you're the first person to pull, pull up a stegosaurus and you don't know what stegosaurus looks like, you know, good luck until you find a skeleton. <laughs> you're not going to get it right. And most of the time we got it wrong in the beginning. So one of those responses in the poll question was comparing uh, fossils to living animals mm -hmm. today. How has that revealed new information? That's been important because as paleontology has moved along, we've gotten a little more biological in how we think about things. We want to know now about how the animals live. We've got two ways of doing that, really. You can look at things that are relatives of dinosaurs, and that would be crocodiles and birds, and they inherited certain shared features that we can study today. Or you can take a view and say, well, let's look at an animal that is similar in the sense that it's a big animal, like an elephant. So maybe there's something analogous about that that helps us understand dinosaurs. Very cool. So have the depictions of dinosaurs over time changed as they were comparing them to different animals or maybe constructing those skeletons in different ways? 
Oh yeah, it's great. If you can, you know, get a chance, you see the sort of history of, of dinosaur illustration. It, it really is like a window into how people were thinking. And so you can see, like, this is one of the oldest pictures of a dinosaur uh, from the 1850s. And you can tell they were looking at kangaroos. They had a two-legged animal. Well, okay, it's not a person. And kangaroos are, is a good model. But after a little bit of study, they realized, well, these are really reptiles. And people got into a little bit of a zone where they thought, well, they should look like reptiles. So now you have these preposterous things crawling around on the ground, which that doesn't work either. Dragging their bellies on the ground. Yeah, it just you literally doesn't work. <laughs> and then, you know, we sort of continually added to what we know about them. And now our view of dinosaurs is that in many ways they sort of stood and walked more like a mammal, very upright, you know, very energetic animals. And so modern depictions are really reflecting that viewpoint now. So these drawings and illustrations that we see of dinosaurs walking and moving in different habitats, is that actually reflective of the habitats that dinosaurs are living in? Can we learn anything from that? It's a, it's a good question because, you know, you look at these pictures, they're all very kind of complete in many ways. But in fact, most of the time, they're not very complete. And we sometimes have information, sometimes we don't. If you can look at a lot of these dinosaur pictures and really it's like they're standing in a parking lot. There's nothing there. There's no plants. There's no other animals, really. That is not how ecosystems work. Um, or you get this kind of very artistic, impressionistic view, and it's just kind of like, how, how maybe did it feel? And that's really what that kind of art is like. And they're great for what they do, but they're not based on the science. And you know, nowadays, we try to have all the pieces of these uh, images uh, be based on something, a fossil or an inference we've made from some no piece of knowledge we have. So uh, for example, here, you know, if you took a time machine back 110 million years ago and without moving mm -hmm. on the spot, this is probably what it would have looked like. This so in Washington, D.C., perhaps. Yep, Washington, D.C. Um, you can go uh, to Laurel, Maryland, to where that, those fossils were collected, and you know, kind of a bayou swamp environment. All those animals, we find those fossils. So what kind of fossils are you collecting to be able to fill in those gaps to better understand what the flora um, looked like in these, the plant life in these um, artist drawings? Well, you know, the ideal thing, of course, is that we just, every time we go out, it's a jackpot. We just keep finding skeletons of all the animals that we want to study, but it never works that way. So <laughs> we have to target places that preserve smaller fossils that are giving us a sample of all these other animals. Um, you know, it's very hard to find a whole skeleton of a very small thing, but you can find pieces of these things and identify them. So that's what we're seeing here with you in your office are these collections of microfossils, mm -hmm. which you've also brought here yeah, for so us this to is, see today. These are examples of those, of those collections, exactly. Very cool. So thank you so much for helping us understand a little bit more about uh, the history of paleontology and uh, some of these small fossils that you get to be able to fill in those gaps. Sure. Matt, let's learn a little bit more about your work with microfossils. You collect microfossils, as you said, to fill in the gaps, but I'm really curious about what studying them and comparing them actually reveals. And in before you jump into it, okay. we're going to ask our viewers again to start pondering that question. All right. That's good. All right. We have another live poll for you to participate in. Tell us what you think. Microfossil comparison reveals individual dinosaur behaviors, dinosaur morphologies, change over time, distribution of dinosaurs. Take a moment to think about it and put your answer in the window that appears to the right of your video. We're both watching the results come in. The, this is kind of exciting. Actually. I know, it really is. <laughs> the bars are changing quite a bit. But 50% of our viewers, now 45%, but still the majority think that it shows change over time. What do you say? Uh, I think most people have gotten it right. Uh, unlike last time, this was not a trick question. Uh, so really, that's the most common thing we use these types of fossils for. Each one of the uh, collections we make of these fossils is like sampling an ecosystem. So you're imagining a moment in time. And by getting more and more of these fossils, we can actually look at how these ecosystems change through time. Very cool. So I think it's time to dive into one of your research sites. I know that you've studied um, somewhere called the Morrison Foundation formation, mm -hmm. an area with different rock layers. Right. Can you tell us about that place? Yeah, so uh, I work a lot in the western U.S. This is a great place to look for fossils because the geology is right there. And in the Bighorn Basin, we have what's called the Morrison Formation. It's late Jurassic, has produced many famous, famous dinosaurs like Stegosaurus. Um, and it's a particular layer of rock, so from a particular time. 
And then above that is another layer of rock that's later, called the Cloverly Formation, that's early in the Cretaceous period. And I study both these. But the Morrison is the one I wanted to show you some things uh, from first. And, and what did you bring to show us? Well, you know, the exciting thing about the Morrison is that even though people have been looking for 100 years, there's still new things to find. And the biggest uh, success for us was uh, finding a lot of uh, dinosaur eggshell. And eggshell, while it's not that rare, finding any amount of it is really rare. And we found essentially 10,000 pieces of this stuff. Now, how can you tell that's eggshell? Well, hopefully you can see it's, it's actually curved like eggshell. It's quite thin. Mm -hmm. um, it has particular texture to it. And so once you sort of understand what it looks like, you can spot it. You just have to sort of believe me with that. But you know, <laughs> if, you, if you come out with me, I'll, I'll show you how to do that. Um, and so once we found a lot of this in one place, we thought, OK, well, this is not just one little piece. There's something there in the rock that we want to get at. So we excavated this huge site. Um, it's a beautiful place to work, um, beautifully colored set of rocks. And right at the top of these uh, outcrops was this layer. And so we pulled out huge blocks full of uh, eggshell. So when you say there were a lot of eggshells, we're talking thousands of yeah, fragments? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, buckets, essentially, of this stuff. It's very hard to see, but it's a very thin layer. Um, but in that layer, it's almost like a pavement, if you can imagine, of these crushed eggs. Um, and the way we look at them is we, we will cut them and look at them sort of in cross-section under the microscope. And that gives us a sense of how they're structured. So this very pretty picture here is showing you the side view of a slice of eggshell. And you can see on the bottom these very kind of vertical crystals growing from the bottom and then these horizontal layers above it. And together that gives us some clue that this is probably a meat-eating dinosaur's egg as opposed to a different kind of dinosaur. Interesting. And what's this here? So this really pretty image is uh, same kind of thing, eggshell again, two of them on top of each other under what's called cathode ray luminescence. And that just means it's illuminating particular minerals. That, and so here, calcite is orange. So calcite is what eggs are made of, yep. even and, today. And it's in our bones <laughs> and other things. It also is involved in fossilization. The most important thing here, though, is that vertical orange stripe in the top left, which is uh, it's actually sediment with calcite filling a pore, which is like a tunnel through the eggshell. And when the animal was, the baby was in the egg, that's how gas would have passed in and out of the egg so it could breathe. So all of this information that you were able to reveal with the imaging and with the fossil fragments, were you able to determine what type of animal or animals were inside these eggs? Yeah, we got really lucky because normally what I just showed you is sort of how, how far we typically get. The eggshell gets you kind of the category of dinosaur. But once we started to actually um, uh, excavate, we were finding these tiny, tiny little bones. You can see this tooth here, very pointed with serrations on it. Beautiful example of a predatory dinosaur tooth. That looks like a meeting, eating tooth. Yep, and, and that is probably a millimeter or two across. And here's an example. I mean, you can see we found quite a few of these little bones. They don't look like a lot. Under the microscope is really what, where you get the information. As a non-paleontologist, I would not know that those were fossils. No, and in fact, it took a lot of work to really understand this. They're so small. Um, the key, though, was finding this piece. And this piece was uh, the, the tip of a snout of a dinosaur. Oh, it's tiny. Yeah, again, doesn't look like too much. But um, once we got it under the microscope, we had a, an artist do a drawing of it up close, and we could see that the tooth, uh, the, uh, the bone has five teeth in it. On the bottom there of that drawing, you can see a few of them sticking out. And he also was able to do kind of a digital sculpture of that. And again, as it comes around the other side, uh, now I can see it. You'll see these uh, pointy little teeth. And because it has five teeth, this is the important thing. In the Morrison formation, there's only one dinosaur that has five teeth in this bone, and that dinosaur is Allosaurus. And Allosaurus, thankfully, is a, a meat-eating dinosaur, so that works. <laughs> so this tells us these are baby Allosaurus bones, and this is an Allosaurus nest. Wow, how interesting. I mean, I've seen the Allosaurus before, but I never really think of it as a baby or right. even think about its nest site. Yeah, I mean, and all dinosaurs have to be babies, and actually the biggest dinosaur eggs are only about this big, and these are even smaller. So, you know, this animal gets to be 30 feet long and a couple tons. That's a really cool example of how tiny fossils are revealing some new information about dinosaurs. Yep. Do you have another example that you can share with us? Well, from the same site, uh, the, what we turned out for us was really even more exciting than that, if you can imagine, was the layer that buried the eggs was also full of fossils. These fossils were microfossils, really small things. And in amongst these microfossils, we got super lucky and we found a skeleton. Um, and this skeleton, um, is of a reptile, and you can sort of see the backbone here. Oh, absolutely. And in fact, here's the head of the animal. And the um, 
teeth are closed, the jaws are shut. Ah, uh, there it is. Um, but it's yeah. actually a relative of lizards, not a lizard itself. It's uh, called a rhynchosaur. Uh, and today, rhynchosaurs are only in New Zealand. The tuatara is the last rhynchosaur in the world. But back in the Jurassic, they were super common, and lizards weren't. So over time, the lizards have kind of taken over. And finding these animals here is part of understanding how that happened. Very cool. So even now, um, it, it bear, like the rhynchosaur that lives now in a place where they, I mean, the only place in the world mm -hmm. can actually find relatives of it from millions of years ago. And, you know, if you'd gone back 150 Here million years, US. you would have seen them everywhere on Earth. Very cool. So these are cool examples, but I'm still having trouble understanding how they fill all of those gaps in understanding the complete ecosystem picture. Yeah, I mean, these are really kind of highlights, right? It's, it's, not, it's not really about the ecosystem in this sense. But um, in a different uh, set of rocks, again, the Cloverleaf Formation, this is above the Morrison, and then even above that, the Judith River in Montana, Lake Cretaceous. In these places, uh, we have really extensive collections. Again, you can see how pretty some of this stuff is. It's just really beautiful places to work, um, although it's, it's really hot. Um, in the Cloverleaf Formation, we had this environment that from the rocks we understood meant it was quite variable. There were lakes and streams and floodplains and all these different places you know, where animals could live, but we just had a few dinosaurs. And I knew that if we went and looked for these microfossils, we could potentially really fill in the story of these environments. So we spent you know, six or seven years out in the field finding all the places we could where this rock was at the surface and we could look at it. And we ended up collecting uh, many thousands of microfossils uh, from the Cloverleaf. Now, seeing some of these microfossils that you've brought here today, and I know I'm not a paleontologist, but I mean, I'm really curious as to how you actually find these. Well, the finding of them isn't that different from finding, you know, a regular fossil bone like this, um, where you're walking around, you're looking on the ground. And, but the trick is, of course, you're looking on the ground for something that's a lot smaller than a typical dinosaur bone. Uh, but you'll find them. You'll find little teeth and little bits of turtle shell. And when you get enough of them in one place, you start to suspect that okay, there's something here in the layer that I'm interested in. You know, and Once we know that, we'll go in, we'll identify the layer, and we just collect the rock layer. I mean, this is us with just bags of dirt. We don't collect the fossil out of the rock yet. We take all of this dirt with us, usually a couple tons. Well, that sounds like good exercise. It is a very good exercise, um, <laughs> and we do weigh it, so we actually know how much we collect. Um, we used to wash it in the field, get rid of the extra sediment with a, a kind of a sieve, but we realized we were washing away some of the fossils when we did that. So nowadays we do all of that in the lab. We just bring back the dirt. We don't do anything in the field and we take care of it all here. Matt, you actually showed me that process, the lab process of extracting the microfossils from the rock, which you've called matrix, which mm -hmm. I see a piece here yep, today. I recognize right that. Um, I think we should show our viewers how you do that. Excellent. All right, let's have a look. So Matt, you're showing us how we get tiny fossils out of pieces of rock. Where do you start? Well, we start with this, which we call Matrix, and this is a rock that's about 75 or 80 million years old that we collected in Montana last summer. And this is kind of the treasure piece for us because we can already see these very tiny black spots all throughout, and those represent fossils and pieces of fossils. Wow, so all of these right here. Exactly. How do you get them out of there? So the trick is to turn the rock back into the sediment that it started as. And the easiest way to do that is just to dissolve it in water. Wow, that's pretty easy. So this right here is just the dissolved rock? Yeah, take a look and you'll see. Oh, yeah. Not that different. Of course, it's a lot less solid and you can see. You can still see all the black flecks, which might be fossils. Yeah, so probably most of those are fossils. And the next step will be to load that into a set of sieves. Give it a quick wash just to clear out some of the first level of sediment, and then we'll get it ready for dunking where we do the longer term soaking. So this is Duncan? This is Duncan, and we have a nice little machine here that will hold these trays. And as you can see, it'll submerge pretty well. So what's the advantage of going a little slow with the dunking process? Well, the advantage for us is that the water doesn't move so fast that it actually grinds the fossils against one another in the screen. So how long will these be dunked for? This will take uh, a few days, not actually that long. We don't have to sit here for a couple days while it runs, do we? Uh, no, fortunately we've got one that's already dry that we can take a look at. So 
these have now dried, these sieves, and it's time to take a look at what fossils we have. What's in there? We can take a look here in the top, some of the dark brown elements. Here's a scale of a garfish right on the top. All oh, right there. It looks like there might be another one right next to it. Yep, you've got one right there. And all told, there's probably a couple dozen fossils uh, in this tray. If, however, we take a look below at the smaller sieve, you can see a lot of really small oh, black wow. spots. Most of those are going to be fossil material. Really? Now, you're going to have to have a microscope to be able to see those, right? Yes, it's impossible for me to look at them uh, just with my bare eyes, so we're going to need to bag these up and take them up to the microscopes. Awesome. Matt, it was really cool to be in your lab to be able to see that. I can see how it would be really addicting finding fossils, even just in the lab. I mean, I myself found a couple fish scales. I have to give myself credit. It was, it was very <laughs> impressive, yes. Uh, and it is addictive. You really have to kind of like watch yourself where you spend all day. There has to be a huge team working on this with you because of all of the sediment that you have and all of the fossils that come out of it. Yeah, there's probably at least a dozen people involved. We have uh, students and interns, a lot of volunteers help us out, and a lot of different uh, staff with different expertise here at the museum. So let's get back to your research at the Cloverleaf Formation. What did you find after you actually extracted the microfossils from the sediment that you found there? Well, you know, each site produces uh, thousands and thousands of these fossils. And so like this tray, for example, probably has uh, about 1,100 fossils in it. It's one particular site. And, uh, you know, by example, um, you'll find tiny fragments of just all sorts of animals. So this example, these are um, uh, armor from a crocodile. This is a jawbone of a very tiny amphibian. Um, and there's also just uh, many different kinds of fishes, freshwater sharks and uh, other kinds of fish. And all told, we end up with something like 50 or 55 species, whereas before we had you know, fewer than a dozen. Do you have any other examples from that um, research site that you can show us here? Well, one really nice example is uh, this fossil here, and this is a, a lungfish. And uh, lungfishes have, uh, they don't have teeth in the sense that we do, but they have tooth plates, and they eat invertebrates and things. They kind of mash them up with these tooth plates. So we're looking at the tooth plate mm -hmm. here. Here's a close-up you can see. And there's a couple different kinds of lungfishes in the Cloverly. What's interesting is that lungfishes don't live in North America anymore. They went extinct right after this formation. They're gone. Today, they live in places like Australia, South America. And so the story of them kind of also petering out and going extinct, is, it's very important in this formation because they're the last ones. So what can you say overall about your research findings at the Cloverleaf Formation? You found fish, you found mm -hmm. um, crocodilians, uh, amphibians. What does that mean? Well, you know, it's, it, it's nice to have this fuller picture. That's really kind of cool. But having so many fossils allows us to actually start to look at the numbers of things. And we can look at uh, how many species we have. And on the top, you can see what's really interesting to me is that uh, dinosaurs are just a quarter of the species in this environment. Most things are uh, fishes and crocodiles and stuff like that. And similarly, if we just count the specimens, dinosaurs are just a little more than a tenth of the specimens. So dinosaurs are not the most important things here. The most important things are the little animals, right? And you know, I mean, if you went on a trip and took a safari and you counted everything you saw, most things are going to be bugs and lizards and things, not rhinos and lions. So really, you're painting the picture with accurate data that shows that mammals and reptiles and amphibians are present in these dinosaur ecosystems and actually how many of them were in um, were there. Yeah, I think the perspective we would have had 100 years ago is just the dinosaur with nothing else. And now really the dinosaur needs to be just a little piece of this big picture. Thank you for helping us better understand a little bit about your research and microfossils. Now we have a lot of student questions. We're going to try to get to as many as we can. Great. Ready to dive in? Absolutely. All right. Mrs. Rhodes' class sent a question. What was the first fossil dinosaur you found? So the first fossil dinosaur I found um, was a piece of a duckbill dinosaur. Uh, and this was in Wyoming in about 1993. Um, and I was on a trip with a bunch of graduate students. I was a college student at the time. But it was, you know, and it wasn't a very important fossil scientifically, but it didn't really matter. You know? it was like, <laughs> I, I actually found it. It would be very exciting. This is Quintet. Quintanil's class asks, how deep do you have to dig to get fossils? Mm. So, you know, that's a really good question because I think um, there is a lot of digging involved, but it's not like digging a mine. We don't ever dig until you see something on the surface. So, you know, if you just start digging holes, you'd never get anywhere. So some of the fossil is right there. 
Um, and then, depending on how big it is, that's how deep it goes. Every now and then you get unlucky and the fossil goes in that way and you have to dig a lot. But usually, you know, it's a few feet. It's not that big. Sheldon Elementary asks, how are T-Rexes able to balance themselves on two feet? <laughs> this is a good question. There's actually scientific research about what happens to a T-Rex if it falls. Oh, no. <laughs> it, it, turns out, it turns out nothing good. Um, t yeah, so T-Rex has a very strong set of muscles, the hip and the upper legs, because it's incredibly important for this animal to stand and not fall. It, once you're a certain size, falling is always bad. And T-Rex is way above that size. So um, it's a very complicated set of uh, bones and muscles that really take care of that for it. This one's from Mrs. Miller's class. How does a dinosaur hatch out of its egg? Is it different for mm. every dinosaur? Ah, so Mrs. Miller's class, you have asked a question that we don't know the answer to. Um, nobody knows what the, what the method was for dinosaurs to get out of their eggs. All I can tell you is they must have had a way or <laughs> they wouldn't have lasted very long. All right, how long does it take to find all of the fossil parts for one dinosaur? If you're lucky and you find a skeleton, then it's just a question of actually digging it out. And you know, digging out a big skeleton can take weeks, maybe a couple of months if it's really big. Um, if you don't have a connected skeleton in the ground and you have to go out and keep finding pieces, there are a lot of dinosaurs, I would say most dinosaurs, we don't have all the pieces for them yet. And this one's from Josh. Is oil more valuable than fossils? Is oil more valuable than fossils? Uh, it all depends on what you want to do with it. So if you need to drive to the grocery store, then oil is more valuable than a fossil. If you want to learn about ancient life, then dinosaurs are more valuable than oil. <laughs> Great response. Matt, can you tell us a little bit about how you became um, interested in paleontology? Sure. Um, I, well, I got interested the way everybody gets interested, which is I was, you know, I was a kid who just thought they were amazing. And in fact, uh, when I was in second grade, um, I, this book, uh, I noticed my friend uh, Mike Devlin, who I haven't talked to in 25 or 30 years. Maybe he's out there. Thank you, Mike, by the way, if you are. Um, reading this book, and I just I saw these pictures. I, I couldn't get enough of this. You know, these were totally fascinating to me. And um, I just, I never kind of gave it up. Most people find something else that interests them. You know, they sort of give up on the dinosaurs. And I just never found anything else that was as interesting. I had a museum nearby that I could go to. I had a great library I could go to. And so all that kind of kept me finding new things and new, you know, new stuff to learn. <laughs> and now here you are at the Smithsonian having fun in our fossil collections. Yeah, it's kind of amazing even <laughs> to myself uh, that here I am, right? All the, I didn't imagine that in second grade. Matt, it's been so fascinating hearing about your work, hearing more about dinosaurs and the microfossils that you study to better understand the ecosystems in which they live. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. This has really been great. Can you tell our viewers where they can learn more? Yeah, so online, if you want to go online, you can visit the paleobiology database. You can look up anything you want about any animal. You could also visit our own website, of what's called Dinosaurs in Our Backyard, and it's all about the dinosaurs in the D.C. area. Um, but, you know, where you live, there are probably fossils. So see what's there. You know, you can just get out in the world and look for stuff. It might not be dinosaurs. might be crinoids. might be trilobites. Who knows? You know, but just, you know, get out and handle things. Go to the library. Go to a museum if you can. Just, you know, get yourself kind of connected to the actual stuff. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you so much for tuning in, and thanks for sending in all of your wonderful student questions. If you missed part of this broadcast or want to see it again, it'll be archived later this evening at curious.si.edu. Thanks again so much for joining us, and hope to see you next time on Science How.